We have looked at uh, quantum Hall effect in a 2D electron gas such as uh, silicon MOSFET or uh, uh, gallium arsenide. Uh, we have started looking at uh, the same phenomena that is quantum Hall effect in uh, graphene. Uh, so, graphene uh, has its own interest uh, for the reasons that we have talked about. Uh, it has a Dirac like dispersion uh, comprising of uh, massless fermions. Uh, the low energy dispersion resembles that of massless Dirac fermions and um, there are many things uh, the physical properties of graphene are by themselves uh, very interesting. And uh, we wish to uh, talk about uh, the quantum Hall effect in graphene and um, there is a possibility that actually the, uh, the quantum Hall effect is realizable at uh, a very large temperature uh, that is uh, comparable to the room temperature and this is what we are going to see. To start uh, that and uh, before we actually talk about uh, quantum Hall effect, uh, we can uh, look at the Hofstadter butterfly which we have uh, discussed earlier. Uh, so, we can look at the Hofstadter butterfly in graphene. Uh, so, the basic idea is that the electrons either in um, say the 2D electron gas or in graphene uh, say if they are particularly in graphene when they are uh, described by the tight binding model and uh, then they are uh, subject to the external magnetic field. Uh, they will show quantized Hall plateaus um, for the Hall conductance or the resistance and uh, consequently the band energies of the electrons uh, transform into discrete uh, Landau levels and um, uh, this is what we are going to find that uh, how the Landau levels look like uh, in graphene. We have seen that already at length uh, for the case of 2D electron gas. Uh, now, this uh, presence of this uh, periodic crystal potential which is the lattice basically which means that V of R is equal to V of R plus R this is the periodicity. So, there is a periodic crystal potential ok. It uh, adds uh, you know further features to the spectrum and that is what the butterfly is all about. So, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian in presence of such uh, periodic potential is written as uh, you know uh, P minus E A uh, whole square over 2 m and plus a V of R uh, and this V of R has this property that we have just talked about and uh, where R capital R is the lattice periodicity. And um, so, uh, the electrons are described by the block states here where uh, K is a good quantum number. So, we are talking about purely about graphene, uh, this is not applicable to the 2D electron gas. So, in presence of this uh, magnetic field or the magnetic vector potential. So, this each uh, block band gets further uh, divided into sub bands and uh, this resultant energy spectrum uh, as a function of the magnetic flux it gives rise to a fractal structure which is known as a Hofstadter butterfly ok. Uh, so, this rather uh, complex looking energy spectra uh, it arises because of a delicate interplay between uh, two uh, length scales of the problem. This is a very important statement. And uh, so, these two length scales are A and um, LB. So, A and uh, LB uh, and uh, these two length scales ok, where A is the lattice constant and LB is the magnetic length which we have said a number of times earlier. So, it is basically the interplay of these two. And um, the Hofstadter butterfly it uh, basically arises when this uh, ratio of these two A and L B is a rational fraction. In fact, more interesting physics arises when uh, the ratio is not a, a rational fraction, but an irrational fraction, but of course, we will not discuss it here ok. So, uh, this uh, fractal nature of the spectrum was first uh, discovered uh, or rather seen by uh, D Hofstadter and that is why it is called as a Hofstadter butterfly uh, in 1980 ok. Uh, when he solved uh, what is called as a Harper equation 
uh, will come to that, uh, but let me not uh, go into details of the Harper equation. And he demonstrated that uh, for uh, you know commensurate values of this flux, so which is uh, phi over phi 0. I told you that the phi 0 is a very important quantity, it is h over e uh, which is uh, the quantum of flux. If this becomes uh, of the form p by q where p and q are um, co prime integers and what is meant by co prime integers is that there is no common factor between them. Uh, if the flux uh, because of the external field is such that then uh, these uh, the single particle uh, block bands uh, they split into q sub bands okay and um, these sub bands are themselves p fold degenerate uh, this is a very important thing uh, which is needed for these uh, butterfly or these uh, fractal spectrum to take place uh, and as I said that there are two length scales in the problem, one is the, the lattice constant which is basically the periodicity of the lattice uh, which is written as uh, r plus r. So, r is equal to nothing but this is equal to a that is the lattice constant and l b is uh, the magnetic length of the problem uh, which we have said earlier it is root over h over e b and uh, the ratio of this will uh, decide uh, what kind of spectrum we get and it turns out that uh, this is related to the fact that uh, these phi over phi 0 these are in a form uh, of a rational fraction p by q being uh, integers co prime integers. So, what happens is this that each of the block bands would split into q sub bands and each of these sub bands themselves are p fold degenerate okay? and uh, each of these uh, p sub bands uh, they is further split as a continued fraction uh, as a function of this magnetic flux that means when the magnetic field is varied uh, it forms a continued fraction. So, if you want to know what is a continued fraction a continued fraction is written as say for example, so this is a continued fraction. So, this is a 0 plus a 1 by a 1 plus a 1 by a 2 plus a 1 by this sort of goes on and then there is a plus 1 by a n kind of thing this is called as a continued fraction. So, uh, these each of the p sub bands they are split into these kind of a continued fraction as a function of this flux phi over phi 0. Say so, I give you an example 181 by 101 is a rational fraction which uh, can be written as uh, 1 divided by 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 3 plus 1 uh, divided by 1 plus uh, 1 over 4 plus 1 by 4 and so on. Okay? So, these are some examples of this uh, continued fraction. So, this is uh, what happens. So, this uh, distance between these levels or these uh, the sub levels etcetera and the width of each of the uh, the superstructure uh, they oscillate uh, with uh, you know as the magnetic field is varied and uh, uh, the period of this uh, variation of this uh, quantity basically it is universal and uh, it, it does not depend upon the particular form of the the quasi particle dispersion etcetera. Okay? So, this is well known we have talked about this. I uh, thought of uh, you know uh, repeating this uh, of these uh, fractal structure in the case of graphene uh, because we have earlier talked about um, uh, in, in the in a different context. Okay? So, let me uh, show you that how we uh, calculate these uh, Hofstadter butterfly for graphene. So, let me take a, a lattice a graphene lattice or a honeycomb lattice with two atoms per basis these red and the white atoms for the sake of you know clarity uh, we have taken these um, lines which uh, correspond to m minus 1 m m plus 1 and m plus 2 in the sort of vertical direction though it is slanted and then we have also taken these the horizontal lines as n n minus 1 n plus 1 and n plus 2 and so on 
and um, so in order to uh, demonstrate the Hofstadter butterfly, we take a ribbon like this and this is called as a semi infinite ribbon. Okay. So, this is the semi infinite ribbon and now we will uh, do this calculation. It has zigzag edges. This is important in the context of graphene that uh, there are two kinds of edges. Uh, this is called as a zigzag edge because as you see that this looks like a zigzag pattern and that is why it is called a zigzag edge. Um, and one uh, the zigzag edge on one edge that is one side means that there is armchair on the other. So, the armchair pattern looks like this. So, this is the armchair pattern and so on. Okay. So, we have taken a zigzag edge and uh, the prescription is clear. We need to uh, change the uh, mechanical momentum of the electrons by including the magnetic vector potential using piles coupling. So, we will uh, use this uh, exponential i e over h i and j uh, a dot d r say for example uh, and a t i j uh, this can be written as exponential uh, i uh, 2 pi by phi 0 and i to j and a dot d r a dot d r and t i j. So, each of the hopping integrals uh, they get modified. So, t i j get modified each pair of the hopping integrals get or the amplitudes get modified by this. So, t i j is the one without any field. So, the information about the field is coming from these exponential term or the phase. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, we know that phi 0 is equal to h over e and uh, we have again taken b to be in the uh, z direction that is the transverse magnetic field that we have always said and uh, b is a constant. And uh, we can take a Landau gauge where uh, this is written as b x y cap. Uh, we have uh, shown another choice of the gauge, another Landau gauge so to say. Uh, which is minus b y x cap, but they would uh, of course uh, yield the same result. Uh, later on, uh, we will uh, talk about a third gauge which is called as a symmetric gauge which is uh, important for a, a different reason. Okay. So, uh, once we fix this, so let me write down the tight binding Hamiltonian. So, now in the tight binding Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy or the hopping amplitude would now get modified by this vector potential because we have an external magnetic field present in the problem. So, just to show you again, I uh, will write it first and then we will go back and show this. So, m and n are the pair of sides. So, T uh, exponential i pi uh, phi over phi 0 and n uh, and a m n dagger b m n plus t exponential minus i pi phi by phi 0. Of course, there will be uh, both the signs present and a m n dagger b m minus 1 n and uh, there will be another term which is t uh, m n dagger b m n minus 1 and uh, plus a uh, Hermitian conjugate. And you see that uh, the hopping along the x direction is um, picks up a phase. This is m n and b m minus 1 n and I uh, will show you the picture that is this. So, these are these uh, coordinates of this. So, one of them, so this one has a coordinate which is uh, say n plus 2 and m minus 1. Okay. So, rather you know because of the, uh, the gauge that we have chosen, the hopping in the y direction is uh, affected because this is along the y direction and in the x direction it is uh, not affected. Okay. And uh, a m n and b m n are the these electron creation uh, operators. Uh, I mean uh, daggers are the creation operators. So, a dagger would be the creation operator 
and uh, so this A is annihilation and uh, this is in A sublattice and same for B. So, B dagger and B are a creation annihilation operators in B sub lattice. So, I think it is clear uh, how these um, Hamiltonian is written uh, which gets modified by uh, these presence of the external magnetic field okay? uh, and a site index each uh, site is represented by two numbers because we are talking in two dimensions it is m and n. Okay? And um, once uh, that is done uh, one can uh, do a Fourier transform of this and which gives you a Hamiltonian. I am not repeating uh, the Fourier transform formula, but all of you know that. So, this is equal to uh, so minus this minus sign is there and uh, there is a, a k and n and uh, so there is a t exponential i pi phi by phi 0 uh, n uh, a k n dagger b k n plus t exponential minus i pi phi over phi 0 and uh, a k n dagger b k n and a uh, plus a t uh, a k n dagger b k n minus 1 plus a Hermitian conjugate. Okay? So, this uh, Fourier transforming okay. if you take this as equation 1 and this as equation 2. So, if you Fourier transform 1 you get 2. So, here uh, then we uh, sort of write down the basis as, uh, so the eigenfunction is assumed to be psi of k equal to sum over n uh, alpha k n uh, a k n plus beta k n b k n and so on and alpha k n and beta k n are amplitudes at A and B sub lattices. Okay. So, this is the setting of the problem that is uh, writing down the tight binding Hamiltonian and including the piles coupling. Uh, and uh, where the, uh, the hopping terms they pick up a phase and uh, the argument of the phase includes uh, the a dot dl or uh, which is nothing but curl a ds which is nothing dot b dot ds and that is where one gets a flux from and uh, then uh, it is of course, uh, this can be solved. So, so, this gives rise to an eigenvalue equation if I solve with this uh, solve uh, h psi equal to e psi. Okay. And once you do that, what you get is that a set of equations which is coupled in an alpha and beta. So, this e k alpha k n equal to minus exponential i k a by 2 to t cosine pi phi by phi 0 n minus k a by 2 okay? into uh, this is a beta k n plus a t a beta k n minus 1. So, this is one equation for alpha k n and this is the other equation for uh, beta k n which is equal to minus exponential minus i k a by 2 to t cosine pi phi over phi 0 n 
माइनस के ए बाई टू एल्फा के एन प्लस अट्टी एल्फा के एन प्लस वन ओके सो दिस इज क्वाइट क्लियर सो लेट मी इन कीपिंग विद दिस इक्वेशन नंबर्स सो दिस इक्वेशन टू यू कैन कॉल दिस इज इक्वेशन थ्री एंड दिस इज इक्वेशन फोर and let's call this as set of equations as equation 5 now this is a set of coupled equation this is nothing but the schrodinger equation written in terms of the amplitudes at the a and b sub lattices uh, for the electrons in presence of a external field and this uh, field gives rise to a magnetic vector potential and the vector potential modifies or renormalizes the hopping between the nearest neighbor sites so once you get this uh you solve solving this these equations and one should get this have to be numerically solved there is no other way and uh, these are for uh, different uh, bands these are solved this n is the band index and what one gets is the following uh, one gets this uh, energy so you this is like a eigen value equation and this eigen value equation can be solved and uh, one lands up with this uh, energy as a function of the external flux and you see that uh, there is a nice symmetry of this and there are these fractal structures which is not very apparent here but then if you zoom in at a particular site here uh, this zoomed in feature uh, looks exactly similar to the entire butterfly okay that's why it's called as a fractal uh, once again just to remind you that uh, the phi over phi 0 has to be a rational fraction of the form p by q p and q both being uh, their co prime integers that is there is no common factor between them okay so this is uh, just talking about graphene in presence of a magnetic field which was needed anyway uh, will uh, do uh, quantum hall effect and uh, before quantum hall effect of course we need to understand the structure of the landau levels and details of the landau levels its properties etc uh, but even before that uh, i want to speak about a few uh, important things in the context of graphene and these things are so some uh, properties of graphene which are basically interesting by its themselves but uh, on the other hand they are also interesting uh, or rather relevant in the context that we are talking about okay we need some experimental ingredients as well and uh, to before we understand uh, graphene Uh, or rather the um, the quantum hall effect in graphene a few things that are uh, interesting here is the density of states okay um it is not very trivial to get the density of states because we know that uh, uh, the density of states for a 2d system uh, with parabolic dispersion is a constant of course here we do not have a parabolic dispersion we have a linear dispersion dirac like dispersion so the density of states needs to be figured out that's one thing uh, then we are uh, going to talk about the electron density okay and um, then we'll of course talk about the fermi energy uh, in graphene we'll also talk about conductivity and so on as i said these are precursors of uh, understanding uh, the quantum hall effect in graphene and uh, these are by uh, in general uh, they are interesting even without the mention of quantum hall effect okay so let's just uh, look at the density of states okay which we call it as so density of states is called as dos so uh, how we uh, can get the density of states near the dirac points we have worked out the dirac points in details and we know that at the dirac points or in the vicinity of the dirac points 
uh, the dispersion is linear and uh, denotes that of massless Dirac fermions. And um, uh, in order to do that, uh, this is quite standard that you equate the total number of electrons uh, with uh, the, I mean write it in terms of the density of states. Here of course, we do not have a volume, but we have an area and this is equal to some 0 to some epsilon and some rho epsilon prime d epsilon prime. Uh, of course, there should be also a Fermi factor inside the integral, uh, but then uh, the Fermi energy or the Fermi distribution is taken to be equal to 1, uh, which is relevant for uh, either you talk about uh, 0 temperature or you talk about low temperature. And uh, the description is only valid if the uh, Fermi energy is very large and which will show that the Fermi energy is pretty large. It is anything between 4500 to 5000 Kelvin. Okay. So, uh, your rho uh, epsilon prime is the density of states which is what we want to find, A is the area. So, it is basically it is an aerial density that we are or the total number of electrons uh, divided by this is uh, the aerial density. So, n by A is called as the aerial density. Okay. So, uh, we are going to integrate uh, this thing from some uh, this uh, expression from the 0 to epsilon till which the uh, linearity of the dispersion holds and uh, we are not sure we just keep it as a symbol. So, it is of course, valid for low energies and as you deviate significantly from low energies this uh, linearity goes down. So, um, uh, once we know this we can write this as uh, A and eta and we will define of course, uh, there should not be any problem. So, uh, where eta is called as the uh, valley degeneracy. And what I mean by valley degeneracy is that uh, there are 2 k and k prime points. Uh, so, uh, these eta is nothing but equal to 2. Okay. So, uh, this valley degeneracy is included because we want to find the total density of states. And now, I convert this energy integral to a momentum and this uh, momentum is uh, say is a function of the energy. So, uh, I change this rho epsilon prime and I use a d q prime and a d epsilon d q prime. Okay. And why I do that is that so rho epsilon prime d epsilon prime is written as rho epsilon prime d q prime d epsilon prime and d q prime. Now, the uh, limit of integration or the other the range of integration is changed from uh, over uh, epsilon to over q, where q is of course, uh, related to epsilon, uh, which is by that linear dispersion that we have talked about. If you uh, want to talk about uh, the spin degeneracy, which is usually not talked about in the case of graphene, but uh, if you include spin orbit coupling, which we will see later. Uh, these there is also another factor of 2 coming from the electron spin degeneracy, which is nothing but 2 s plus 1 for s equal to half it is 2. All right. So, we have epsilon as going as q. Okay. So, this is what we have learned that the low energy dispersion is linear. So, we have d epsilon d q to be equal to constant. Okay. Uh, which, which gives of course, the velocity. Uh, even though this uh, proportionality looks like uh, that of photon, uh, but of course, the proportionality constant is not the speed of light, but rather it is a Fermi velocity of the electrons. So, uh, if I uh, have uh, this equation 1 and this equation 2, uh, then uh, these two can be reconciled. If I write down the uh, the density of states as a q divided by d epsilon d q. Now, if I use using epsilon equal to h cross a v f q, this is the Dirac dispersion. Uh, then uh, d epsilon d q becomes equal to a constant which is nothing but h cross v f. Even if you write h cross equal to 1, it does not matter, but let us keep it for the time being. Uh, and so, from here, 
uh, the rho epsilon uh, it comes out as uh, is like epsilon and then h cross square v f square. This is quite interesting and it is in contrast with uh, a parabolic dispersion where the density of states is independent of energy whereas this is a uh, function linearly a function of energy and so the density of states really behaves like okay so this is rho of epsilon and epsilon okay so uh, the the density of states behaves uh, linearly with epsilon and this is one of the interesting uh, things or it is also an important thing because as soon as you try to calculate uh, physical properties, physical quantities, uh, experimentally measurable quantities, the density of states come into the picture because the density of state dictates that how many carriers there which are electrons here, how many electrons are there which near the Fermi energy which would contribute to the say for example, the transport properties etcetera. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, go to the next one to calculate the electron density. So, what is the typical electron density in graphene? Okay. Is it the same electron density that we talked about in 2D electron gas such as silicon MOSFET or um, gallium arsenide or some uh, structure uh, which is uh, some super lattice structure that we talk about in the context of 2 d electron gas. It is in fact, uh, something like 2 orders of magnitude more. Uh, so, let me refer to the original uh, experiment done by Geim who was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, discovery of graphene. So, this is what graphene is. So, this is the SiO2 the uh, silicon uh, oxide substrate uh, say this is D the thickness over which it is grown and this is graphene, graphene okay. and uh, there is a, a sort of a voltage that is uh, applied here uh, relative to the back surface which is let us call it as V g and um, uh, this uh, D is usually of the order of 300 nanometers. So, graphene is grown on that on this substrate SiO2 is the substrate and in addition to that uh, what you have done is that uh, you have applied a gate voltage with respect to the uh, bottom part of this thing. So, this uh, looks like a capacitor that is formed and uh, we know that what is the capacitance of a capacitor? The capacitance of a, such a capacitor is uh, uh, it is C is equal to uh, epsilon A over D okay, where A is the area and um, epsilon is the uh, dielectric constant. of S i o 2. Okay. Um, and uh, of course, A is the area as I said and D is the, the thickness which is written here. So, uh, if you want to calculate the carrier density N e this is equal to C v g by e where v g is the gate voltage. So, this is equal to epsilon by D e and a VG. So, uh, for a VG of about 100 volts, any e comes out to be about 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 13 per centimeter square. So, this is the typical electron density that is found and uh, this is at least uh, 2 orders of magnitude more Okay. So, this is uh, an important thing, but there is another thing that is very important here which was uh, not there in the 2D electron gas. You see as V g is increased, okay, N e can be made larger that is the electron density uh, at the Fermi level that can be made larger by applying larger gate voltage. And not only that the sign of V g would determine 
that any can be uh, both positive and negative. So, you can have positive charge density or negative charge density depending on the sign of V g. There is also an important point. Okay. So, uh, let us just look at the Fermi energy quickly. So, this is the, the third point is Fermi energy. Okay. So, uh, the Fermi energy can be obtained in the following fashion. We have already uh, worked out that the density of states is uh, linearly proportional to uh, epsilon. So, rho epsilon is uh, equal to uh, epsilon and then N e which uh, goes as uh, epsilon f square. So, that is basically the, the 2D feature. So, N e goes as epsilon f square which tells you that this is like a q f or k f square which is a Fermi wave vector square. Uh, because there is a linear dispersion, this is unlike uh, parabolic dispersion. So, epsilon f is then uh, proportional to root over n e. Okay. So, which means that the Fermi energy depends on the electron density and uh, for an electron density just to have a square root, we let us take n e equal to say for example, 10 to the power 12 per centimeter square. Of, we have of course, written as 10 to the power 13 in the last slide, but uh, just uh, to have uh, no confusion with the square root, let us just take it as 10 to the power 12, which I uh, will be able to do a square root. So, this epsilon f turns out to be something around 4.5 electron volt. So, this is the value of the Fermi energy in graphene. Okay. And, um, so, this uh, 4.5 electron volt is, is pretty large and if you consider the corresponding Fermi temperature that is very large. So, um, you know this means that graphene is a, a highly degenerate system at room temperature because uh, room temperatures can also be taken as almost like 0 Kelvin and at 0 Kelvin the system is actually a degenerate Fermi gas. Okay. And uh, then let us uh, look at the conductivity of graphene. And uh, the conductivity can be obtained from the Drude formula, which is equal to, so this is a Drude formula. and this N e is the electron density, E is the electronic charge and mu is the mobility which is known to be very high for graphene. So, mu can be defined uh, you know using the relaxation time which is equal to E tau over uh, m f where m f is the uh, mass of the carriers at the Fermi energy. And uh, so, the tau is the relaxation time. So, relaxation time just to remind you that it is the time between two successive collisions. Okay. So, here uh, it shows that m f is actually not a constant, but it depends on the electron density. Okay. If we use the mean free path, the definition of mean free path which is say m f p divided by v f. So, l m f p is the mean free path. And v f is the Fermi velocity. Okay. So, this is uh, tau. So, uh, mu becomes equal to e L m f p by putting this tau expression on the top and this is equal to a v f m f. Okay. So, that tells you that the sigma it becomes equal to uh, e square over h which is the scale of the conductivity or the conductance 
So, this is equal to L m f p into root over n e and so which means that sigma is proportional to root over of n e. So, this is the dependency of the conductivity on the electron density this can be also written as uh, so this is like e square over h and a k f which is a fermi wave vector and the lmfp this is a dimensionless quantity if you see because your k f has a dimension of uh, inverse of length and lmfp has of course the dimension of length that will tell you that they'll cancel each other okay so um, now of course we'll do uh, derivation of Landau levels in graphene and how would we do that? We will uh, just uh, put in plug in this minimal coupling or the piles coupling into the Schrodinger equation with a particular choice of the gauge and um, then uh, solve for the energies and these energies will be the Landau level energies. Exactly we have done the same thing. However, in 2D electron gas we have talked about uh, the electrons to be in continuum. Now, we are not talking about electrons to be in continuum, the electrons are confined to a lattice geometry or rather 2D honeycomb lattice geometry and um, uh, the problem is further compounded by the fact that there are two uh, sub lattices uh, A and B both corresponding to of course the carbon atoms, but uh, this will give you a structure 2 by 2 structure and if in addition to the 2 by 2 structure if you take into account the uh, valid degeneracy that is the uh, the physics occurring at both the k and k prime points together then uh, the size of the Hilbert space or the size of the Hamiltonian matrix goes from 2 by 2 to 4 by 4 um, and of course in some situations which we will encounter later that if you have um, a spin orbit coupling that is uh, spin is a coupling to the orbit then we cannot talk about spin polarized uh, electrons uh, anymore and we have to talk about uh, each spin separately. Incidentally here just like the 2D electron gas the Zeeman effect is negligible ok. The uh, Zeeman effect means the, the Zeeman effect if you remember that the Zeeman energy is um, is E z equal to G mu b b ok, uh, G is called as the Landau G factor. This has been discussed in the context of 2D electron gas, but I am still renewing those discussion here and um, so this is usually equal to 2 for electrons in graphene and this is then it is equal to E h cross over m into b. So, in principle you know because uh, the Landau levels are uh, the Landau levels also have this as uh, n plus half only talking about um, h cross omega b so this 2 d e g ok. So, the scale is set by h cross omega b and uh, so omega b if you remember it is equal to e b over m. So, uh, these E L L and E Z are of the same order, but actually in experiments it does not happen. Uh, in fact, E Z which is a Zeeman energy scale is much smaller and uh, it is for that reason that uh, uh, we can still ignore uh, the presence of uh, electronic spin into the problem. Because um, in fact, in a 2D electron gas uh, it can be shown that uh, which we have done in some sense that uh, the uh, nth uh, uh, Landau level for up spin it coincides with say for example, n plus 1 nth uh, Landau level for the uh, for the down spin. So, the, there is basically a degeneracy uh, and then this uh, spin really does not count uh, much into that discussion. And uh, same here uh, unless one has a strong spin orbit coupling. Uh, there is no uh, need to talk about spin. So, we will be mostly happy with a 4 by 4 Hamiltonian to be solved instead of a single expression for the Hamiltonian which we have done for um, the 2D electron gas. So, we have taken a Hamiltonian solved it for a given a gauge 
and we got the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues and these eigenvalues came out to be just this. Okay. Um, however, these things are going to be more complicated, uh, there is a matrix structure to the eigenvalue equation and hence you have to diagonalize the matrix in order to find the eigenvalues and um, their uh, dependencies on these n, the Landau level index will have to be found out and it turns out that the Landau level index uh, does not have the same structure as it is here. So, we will see this in the subsequent discussion that this Landau level uh, is not does not go with n, but it goes with root over n and uh, in fact, it, it sort of goes as root over n into b. Uh, there is a mod of n that I have written if you notice uh, this mod of n means there are uh, positive and uh, negative values of n that are uh, that are allowed uh, which is again unlike the one that we have done for uh, the case of uh, 2D electron gas. Okay. So, uh, this are uh, going to be coming up and once when we understand the structure of the Landau levels and their properties. Uh, doing a uh, quantum Hall effect is only uh, doing a Kubo formula, putting it in a Kubo formula which we have seen elaborately that uh, putting that into the Kubo formula, these uh, wave functions and energies and uh, then getting this Hall conductance out. And um, uh, just like 2D electron gas, we will see that these uh, plateaus are quantized, but the quantization is not same as they are for the electron gas. Uh, in fact, um, there is a half integer quantization uh, and also the, uh, the width between successive Landau levels in terms of temperature, uh, these are very large. So, these are very large numbers which uh, goes on to say that these Landau levels or quantum Hall effect in graphene should be realizable at room temperature. So, uh, first we will talk about the uh, obtaining the Landau levels and uh, there will be I will be doing a rigorous derivation of uh, obtaining the Landau levels. As I said that it is not that straightforward as it was for the 2D electron gas. So, we will have to uh, be uh, careful and uh, watchful on the derivation so that you can uh, <laughs> recreate it or rather uh, you can produce reproduce it on your own and uh, then we will uh, talk about the, uh, the quantum Hall effect. We will not uh, undergo through again a rigorous derivation of the Kubo formula, but we will simply state the results uh, of the quantization of Hall conductance in graphene. Mm -hmm.